gun. You can't fight in here. This is the war room. Shit filters full. Really? Yeah. I always go backwards when I'm backing up. What are you under? Yeah, he's got to do something for a living these days. Diane ain't much of a living boy. You failed to maintain your weapon, son. It's liberty! It, it's her! Whiskey, quick. Master, we are here. But what I do have are a very particular set of skills. <laughs> <laughs> Why is mad? Something is going to happen. What's going to happen? Something wonderful. You can call it the art of fighting without fighting. We started a game we never got to finish. I was just fooling about. I wasn't. Why don't you make like a tree and get the fuck out of here? Give me liberty or give me death! <laughs> Good day, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Ernest Emerson Podcast, a podcast where both you and I get to talk with, listen to, and ask questions of some of the most interesting people in the world. We only have one disclaimer. If you are offended by the truth, please go away. Well, good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Ernest Emerson Podcast. I'm here with Danny T. this morning. Danny, how are you? Pretty good. How are you doing, Ernie? Uh, I'm doing well, actually. Uh, I was out uh, sailing yesterday on the on a sailboat, so I'm feeling pretty good. I uh, got a little little sun. Uh, oh, my, nice. Yeah. Uh, my, my wife always tells me I've got a ghost tan, whatever that means, but <laughs> <laughs> I'll live with that. But uh, today we got a, a real interesting uh, guest on, and uh, before I get to him, I'm going to read something here that uh, that, we, that I wrote uh, a little bit ago, and uh, it's called Unarmed and Dangerous. You have far more to fear from a deadly man than a deadly weapon. That statement was told to me a long time ago by a very deadly man. It was very true, simply. If you take away the deadly weapon, you still have the deadly man to deal with. And a truly determined deadly man is still a powerful force to reckon with. What it meant to me was this, a threat, whether with a weapon or not, is still a threat. And until that threat is neutralized, you are still in danger. It also meant that I should not be fixated on the weapon, but on the man, because if I destroy the weapon, the man is still there. If I destroy the man, the weapon is no longer deadly. This was a concept that I taught in all of my classes as a basic principle of combat. This was necessary in order to set the combat priorities into action and order. Otherwise, trainees would spend all of their focus and time chasing after and defending against the weapon rather than on destroying the threat. This is what I taught as the fundamental foundation for building any effective self-defense program for years. But then, I eventually realized that if I was teaching my students about the concept of the dangerous man, didn't that principle work in both directions? After all, I've always taught that the principles don't care where they're applied. They apply equally as well to both the good guys and the bad guys. If I'm teaching trainees to have to deal with a dangerous man, shouldn't they be the dangerous man as well? In other words, the mental shift is this. Against any opponent, whether I am armed or not, and whether the opponent is armed or not, I am the dangerous man. My opponent, the bad guy, is going to have to deal with me. And that's not going to be very pleasant for him. Which now leads me to the premise statement of this discussion, unarmed and dangerous. Many of us consider themselves armed only if they possess some type of weapon. In regard to tactical or military training, we could call it weapons dependency, and that can be a fatal mindset, for if an individual considers himself unarmed, unless he or she has a weapon in their hand, then he has mentally placed himself at a self-perceived position of inadequacy or weakness against the opponent, whether that opponent is armed or not. 
this perceived position of weakness is not a good starting point to mount a determined counterattack against violent aggression. Remember this. Victory in combat relies heavily on psychological dominance of the opponent. You can't be dominant if you think you are in a weak position or at a disadvantage. In that case, you've already given up dominance to the opponent. In the end, you must decide right now that you are that dangerous man. Against any aggressor, if you are still breathing, you are going to prevail, and a dangerous man is never unarmed, whether he has a weapon or not. Just remember what I was taught so long ago. You have far more to fear from a dangerous man than you do from a dangerous weapon. Be the dangerous man. Now, folks, today we have a dangerous man to talk to. And I believe that uh, we'll probably discuss a couple of things that, uh, that I just uh, read to you because we have today uh, Mr. Tu Lam. Uh, he is a veteran, I believe, too, of 22 years in uh, Army Special Forces. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Well, uh, Tu, welcome to the podcast today. It's a pleasure to have you. Uh, I can't wait to talk to you about all this stuff. I know you're uh, a, a training fanatic, which fits in uh, real good with, with our way of life and everything. So uh, welcome to the podcast, Mr. Tu Lam. Thank you. Arigato. Thank you for having me on. You're very welcome. Um, well, Tu, I, I know that you have a very interesting story. I've, I've briefed a little bit on, on your background, but I, I want to hear it from you uh, because it, it's a fascinating story, and uh, it's, it's, it's one of those things that uh, I can only think that made you uh, who you are today and made you a stronger uh, man. Because, again, uh, I know you're well-versed in, in uh, the philosophy uh, of, of Bushido and everything else and, and probably Chinese philosophy and all that, too. But uh, it brings to mind when I read about uh, what you had gone through that uh, – what doesn't kill us only makes us stronger, and I think you're going to be a living testament testament to to that fact. So, too, if you would just uh, take us through uh, how you got kind of here today. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for having me on. You're welcome. Uh, you know they they say you know as a, a philosophy Chinese art of war they say a thousand uh, a journey of a thousand miles begin with one step. Well, my first step was one to war. I, I was born in war. Mm -hmm. I was born during the fall of the uh, of Saigon in the Vietnam War. And um, my family, after the communists came over, my family was drugged out in the streets and uh, gunned down like animals. And my grandfather pretty much took us and uh, took his life savings because he said, there's no way in hell that my two grandsons will grow up to be communists. Yeah. So he gave everything he had for us to be free. Now, this journey to freedom was one of great risk because, you know, we escaped on a wooden boat. Imagine like a fishing boat, you know, overstuffed with hundreds of refugees mm -hmm. leaving. So anybody who's leaving, they obviously, they, they have their life uh, belongings on their backs. You know, we had our clothes. We had a few goat bars that... Um, my grandfather gave us the smugglers out of country. So there was a lot of pie tree going on. You know, a lot of uh, bandits would come in from Indonesia, from mm -hmm. Thailand to rape and pillage yeah. all the refugees that were coming out. So first we had to navigate past that, you know. So somehow we navigated past the pie tree and then we went into uh, the shores of Indonesia where we were stopped by the Coast Guard. Mm -hmm. And they, um, they shot at us, told us to stop because they didn't want their problems in their country. They didn't want the, the refugees in their country. Just kind of like, you know, if you think modern day Syria, you know, America's, yeah. you know, everybody's trying to escape and they're trying to look for a home, man. You mm -hmm. know, um, so they stopped us. They anchored us uh, on. They drugged us out deeper into the ocean, um, cut the line, shot our engine. And pretty much left us there to die. Wow. So we drifted. Um, my mother say we drifted for a good close to two weeks. We drifted out in the ocean. And um, people were dying. 
and uh, they were getting thrown over, uh, over, overboard. Mm-hmm. People were starving, dehydration. So you think about one of the worst living conditions. It's probably the way that my mother described it. It seemed like it was hell. Yeah, pretty much. Pretty close, buddy. Yeah. So we got caught up in a storm, and somehow the storm washes into Soviet waters, which you know it, it makes me. I, I think this story and what happened to me when I was young made me very spiritual as a person because somehow this storm washes into Russian's waters where this Russian supply boat came across to go into Singapore. So somehow now this, this teaching, my very first teaching was one of humanity mm-hmm. where these Russians were the same ideology that took me out of my country that, that ripped us up our freedom and our life. Yeah. But the same people, the same ideology, looked past that and pretty much saved our lives. They took us on board, uh, took us to uh, Indonesia, uh, left us at a refugee camp. They saved mm-hmm. our lives, Ernie, you know? Yeah. And uh, Literally. and that, that resonated with me, even though I was too young to remember, even though, you know, I didn't know, I didn't catch what was going on because I was only two. Yeah. You know, but hearing what my mother's saying, seeing how she raised me, it, it really changed my mythology, changed my mindset at a very young age. So these Russians, they, they dropped us off in a uh, refugee camp in Indonesia where uh, we lived, uh, like I said, live uh, in grass huts. And these monks would come down mm-hmm. and pretty much take care of us. Uh, my my aunt married an American special forces lieutenant. Uh, when he was fighting a war mm-hmm. and he expedited the paperwork for us to come over to the United States. He sponsored us. Yep. When we came over to the United States, uh, we went straight into Fayetteville, North Carolina, Fort Bragg, North Carolina. <laughs> right? <laughs> oh yeah, you know. <laughs> you know. So with that said, you know, the biggest military base, the biggest, yeah. the home of special operations, yep. you know, when it comes to the Army. So I was raised around that. My my mother eventually remarried to American Special Forces, and uh, I was indoctrinated into the Green Berets, into the Special Forces life when I was eight years old. I mm-hmm. was, when I say I was indoctrinated, I was uh, <laughs> speaking different languages. Yeah. I was learning martial arts. I was navigating the stars. I was taking apart weapons, you know, yeah. the Green Berets stuff. Hell yeah. But, you know, but, you know the, the thing was funny, Ernie, was that my father, he wasn't training me to be a Green Beret. He didn't, you know, he had no expectations of mm-hmm. me being that. He just wanted to spend father and son time together. Yeah. And that's the only way he knew how to do it. Exactly right. right. <laughs> but along with that, you know, came really strict discipline. You know, like yeah. uh, when I say strict discipline, as in my, my, in the Asian culture, you know, you have to be academically mm-hmm. smart. You have to, you have to score the grades in school. Otherwise, you shame yourself you and shame your family, everyone, right? Yeah. Right. Even the A minus is shameful in, in the Asian <laughs> culture. So uh, it was really heavy on the books. But my father, my, my stepfather, every day I would run two miles down uh, the backwoods in North Carolina. Mm-hmm. I remember this dirt trail road through uh, through the woods and uh, the pine trees. I would run down. He, he would make us take a T-shirt. So we'll run a mile out. And there's a lake that we had to run to, and mm-hmm. we had to take off our T-shirt, dip our T-shirt in the water, and run back. So he know that we, we made that. <laughs> right. <laughs> no, we made it that point. <laughs> now, my brother, he was funny. My brother became a doctor later on. Mm-hmm. And my brother wasn't a warrior. He's, he's not a warrior at all. Not, <laughs> not anywhere close. Loved the guy. Yeah, Very yeah. smart. But he would always, like, uh, take off his shirt and, and, and try to bribe me. Right to dip his shirt too, and he'll wait for he'll me wait at the halfway half point. Right, um, so That's I was funny. making I was making some money on the side because of that too. My my father caught wind of it. Yeah, he uh, he punished us with some manual labor because uh, yeah. that wasn't ethical. Right. Uh, so we I, I learned that lesson to to do things the right way. Yeah, but if you're going to cheat, don't get caught. Yeah. You know, so uh, so I was raised around that. We we were raised around. Um, I couldn't wear blue jeans to school. I had to wear slacks. I was raised around the martial arts and the discipline. 
the, tr- the true martial arts, not the the martial arts you see today where it's all about kicking ass, right? Yeah. It was more about the spiritual connection with with who I am and, and, and my soul mm-hmm. and my spirit. And the spirit guided me later on because of that connection to the martial arts. Mm-hmm. You see, Ernie, when I when I joined the the special forces, you know, being on the A teams, I was I was different, right? And when I say I was different, it was my methodology, my mindset was different. Yeah. Because I was a martial artist. Mm-hmm. You know, so a lot of the the lethal training that we did, I was able to tie that to the roots of the Bushido, the the, the Budo, yeah. the, mm-hmm. the art of war, the way of teaching. Because mm-hmm. I studied art of war through the majority of my life, you mm-hmm. know, pretty much. I was yeah. born in war. You were indoctrinated in, from the beginning, yeah. Yeah, and I spent majority of my adult life fighting, you know. So my life was dedicated to the art of Budo. Mm-hmm. Well, let me ask, uh, since you were uh, talking about that spiritual connection, what uh, what martial arts were you training in at that time? Was it uh, the, the classical styles or...? Well, my my father started me up in uh, Muay Thai, so mm-hmm. it wasn't classical uh, Muay Thai, as you know. It was very hard, yeah. rigid style. And being so young, I mean, it really banged up my nerves and my arms and my shins. So I was able to get rid of all those nerves yeah, yeah. and the senses when I was that very young. Anyways, <laughs> right? They helped me out later because all my all my joints are really hard right now. But but the thing was, I started off very hard. I yeah. started off in hard forms. Uh, I didn't get really spiritual. I was saying to my mid twenties mm-hmm. when I truly understood, yeah. like you know, the martial art teacher. Because you can't, you can't really understand it at such a young age. No, nope. it's deep. You know, it wasn't to my first few uh, conflicts and battles on uh, mm-hmm. the A teams is when I started understanding the bigger purpose, the higher purpose of things. And it mm-hmm. didn't really hit me into my mid thirties. You know, when, There's when a I maturity. started to understand yeah. there is, right? So you, you are a student at the martial arts. So you, you probably read the book of five rings. I have indeed. Yeah. Right. And if you read the book of five rings when you're a teenager and then you read the book of five <laughs> rings now, you understand my How friend, true. that it's two different meanings, two different books, right? actually two yeah. different books. Right. So I have, 15 copies of the book of five rings <laughs> i've got three and, <laughs> you beat me <laughs> yeah, yeah some of it's in uh mandarin some of it's yeah. in um you know uh, japanese but mm-hmm. majority of it's in english and what i bought around the world you know i yeah. traveled to 27 countries wow and that book really resonated with me you know it helped me out today and it actually helped me entrepreneur the, the company mm-hmm. uh that i i came to you know spearhead Yep. Uh, at this present moment in my life. You know, I'm going to I'm going to take a hard right turn here for a second. Uh when you mentioned the communist, uh I just returned from Cuba. And the people first I, I have to say the people are wonderful. They're warm, friendly, they're happy. Uh they're they're singing and dancing, but the country of Cuba it is falling to pieces. It yeah. is it is a shambles. Uh, there are restrictions on owning. You, you really can't own a business. You can own a. a you can ha- have a room in your house where you can serve food. That's about the only business that a, an individual can own. Uh, you can't own a house. Uh, to get a car, it has to be inherited down through the family, and, and the infrastructure is literally falling. To pieces, and I mean, it looks like bombed out France after uh, World War II. Now, that's it, to me that was a living testament to the fact that communism and socialism uh, does not does not function. It does not work, and uh, it, it it was a real splash in my face because what I would see about Cuba before we went was the facade that is presented to us. And once I was there and talked to the people and got a chance to wander about, I, I saw what I believe was, you know, the real face of Cuba, which is a bunch of poor people struggling. Two, it's in the middle of the Caribbean Sea. The fish, the fishing industry would be huge. They don't have a fishing industry. They don't even have – you or I couldn't go fishing because there's no boats. No one can build boats. There's no lumber 
to build a boat. And if, if you decided to be a boat, build, boat builder, you couldn't do it because that would yep. be an individual business. So uh, when you said that, you know, that you escaped the communists, then were saved by the communists, uh, it, it, what pipped in my head was this. It's not the person. People are good. Yeah. People yes. are good. It, it, the uniform that they put on to survive sometimes forces them to act in certain ways. And, and believe me, I'm all about there is evil in the world, and there are bad, bad people that, that are broken or are ideologically framed, uh, you know, biased for, for bad things. But the people themselves, uh, I, I, I do believe in the good, the good of humanity. It's just that these insane ideological things get placed on, on, you know, people that force them into doing things that are, yeah, are sometimes terrible. But absolutely. when you said that, I was like, you know, the Russians, they had compassion that they couldn't leave you guys in that water. Yeah. And yet they were. I, I tell you, I, I tell you, Ernie, my biggest battle with that, man, and it ties into that, that teaching, my very first teaching in humanity. Mm-hmm. And it was very hard. You know, when I say it's very hard, to take a life isn't hard because it's two pounds on my trigger pull, Roger or it's, a, it's a blade. Yeah. It's, it's, it relies on my tactics and training, which I was, I, 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 I have mm-hmm. many years mastered. The thing is this it's humanity, right? If, if you, raise your right hand and you swore an oath as a, a modern day samurai, modern day knight, yep. you know, to, to go and free those oppressed, which I did. I, I went to these foreign countries to free those oppressed. But let me ask you this, mm-hmm. a, a boy who's eight years old, a child, a child, and then rebel forces come into that village, pull everybody out, gun down their, gun down their family, yep. give his, give the boy a machete and tell him to hack up his sister or they will hack him up yeah. just like they did his family. Yeah. Now you tell me, is that boy, is that boy a bad person? Is he, or is he just trying to survive, man? Or he, yeah. eight years old, how can you really make a yeah. life and death decision? So that, that boy grows up to be a warlord. Yeah. Right. That boy hardens. He hardens he, up. He, yeah. he, he had to mature. Yeah. So that was the hardest thing because I seen this. I seen the evils all around the world from the Philippines to Africa to all through Asia. You yeah. know, mm-hmm. my, my prominent location was the Philippines because of the war over there. Yeah. It, you see in the Middle East. I, I seen in, um, uh, you know, Northern yeah. Europe. So it's, it echoed through me through my whole life. And that, that first lesson of humanity was reinforced through my whole life. So as a soldier, as a professional special operations soldier, mm. it, 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 it did bother me, man. You know what I mean? It, it did bother me because I have been on that flip side. Oh, yeah. You know, my family was drugged out in the streets and guns, so I understood what, it, what these boys are going through. Yeah. Well, so what do you do when they're firing at you? What do you do when they're shooting at you and, and fighting, you know? So that, that was the biggest issue. Uh, that I had, and it tied into that first lesson that you wanted. Know, mm-hmm. Well, you know, it's it's one of those, you know, war is war is hell. There is no other way. You, you can't. I think at times, people. I don't want to say they glorify war, but uh, the people that never have to pick up a weapon uh, mm-hmm. at times are a little bit. Uh, quick on the trigger if you will to send yep. people into uh, combat yes sir and you know unfortunately uh, that's what that's the state of the world right now where we have gotten to the point where there's a lot of things going on and it's it's force for, it's only force that can undo some of this stuff and the byproduct of that is poor innocent people or people that are forced into situations. Uh, it's a yes, fact sir. of life. Yeah. There's no way around it. You, you can't unfuck it, so to, so to speak. Pardon well, my Ronald point. Reagan, you know, he said that we're only one generation from losing our freedom, for oh, our yeah. freedom to be extinct. And it's so true, man. Yeah. You know, and, and I'm a living testament to that. I, I, yeah, you are. I, it, ha- it personally happened to me, but also I've seen it 
throughout multiple different countries, yeah. you know, and, and I have been on the, the giving end of it too, mm-hmm. you know, with, with the war. But the thing is this, it's, um, it's coming to America and you know it. Oh yeah. Yeah. You know, it's coming to America. Um, obviously the, the overpopulation, you can see the rise in crime. I do train a lot of law enforcement. I have yep. for the last three years since I've been out and I, I could tell you the border wars, uh, a lot of the the, uh, um, the drug wars are going on right now. The people know that the terrorist uh, cells, their sleeper cells in the United States, they're they're oh, yeah. rise. You know, so you know it's it behooves us as warriors to to give, to train. You know, and that's that's truly the path of Bushido, anyways. Well, it, it's interesting that you bring that up because uh, the the United States is a perfect country for a terrorist to operate in. We have so many freedoms. We have so much openness uh, that y- you really don't even have to hide all that much uh, yeah. here. Uh, fortunately, we have, we have uh, good systems in place that work uh, tirelessly at this, but I think the average people do not understand the determination that the bad guys have. Uh, they, they look at a something that makes the news and say, oh, those, those guys uh, shot something up or they, they were caught uh, before they were able to perpetrate their, their act of violence or whatever. It's a constant. It, it, they're not sleeping. When, when they're, and people don't even understand the fact that, you know, when they decide they want to take down a plane, they're going to keep trying to take down that plane, whether it takes one year, three years, five years, or ten years. They're still... They still probe all the time. The, the FAMs and that that we've talked to over the years, uh, they say it's a constant probing of, of our... Well, I, I, could, yeah. I could definitely tell you this. Their, their mentality is a no-stop mentality. When, when I say that is, you know, you always hear about the suicide bombers. You, you know, you hear about it, mm-hmm. but to truly see it, to truly see it, man. You know, like there was a time in Iraq where I came back and... Uh, uh, backside containment, so you contain isolated target, mm-hmm. and um, we had squatters uh, come out the rear of the building, and they were strapped with uh, suicide bombs. Yeah, and I remember uh, my teammates and I were trying to put them down. They're running at us at full speed, as fast yeah. as they could sprint towards us, and we're trying to put them down. But to truly see them take their own life like that. That is dedication, regardless yeah. of what you believe or not. Like that is a no quit mentality for you yeah. to give up your life for whatever cause you believe in. Mm-hmm. That's what we're facing. You know, that's the determination that we're facing. If they're willing to put a bomb on them to run at us full charge. Um, that's the violence that we're going to face in America in the future. Yeah, and um, it's funny because uh, I've spoken to several. Uh, uh, border patrol guys in the last few weeks actually and they said one of the interesting or interesting one of the the new things is because canada had such a an open door policy regarding uh the uh, refugees that they've taken on a huge amount of people up there uh, from the mid-east and we're all worried about the uh, southern border with mexico and yeah. When you look at the Canadian border, it's huge. I think it's even longer mm-hmm. than the border with Mexico. And there's, I mean, it's not like you have to tramp through the uh, desert, uh, you know, dying no. of, of, of dehydration up there. You can you can That's right. pierce this uh, border anywhere along those couple thousand miles. Yeah. And that uh, they've, they've now found that uh, that's a backdoor for us, too. Yeah. So, too, I know that uh, you spent all this time in the Philippines, and uh, I, I want to talk about a little bit about that because I have a, a lot of friends that are Filipinos, and I trained with uh, some Filipino guys, which we'll, we'll get to in a couple minutes. But what's, what's the state of the, the terrorism, uh, and, and what's the name of the terrorist group and all that? Because, again, we get a little tiny feed here and there on the news, but what's going on over there? Yeah, absolutely. So the war has been going on in the field. Well, they call it conflict, but, you know, we've been actually gunfights going on over there yep. and IEDs going on. But the thing is, uh, special forces came in to advise and assist. So basically, uh, right a year before 9-11 hit, uh, we flew into the Philippines to train uh, their LRC, which is their 
counter-terrorist or top-tier counter-terrorist mm-hmm. unit. Uh, for three years, we, we advise, assist, and train them under, uh, after the CIA kind of vetted uh, the guys in. Yep. So uh, the, the threats in the southern regions of Philippines, even to Manila, uh, which is the main island, uh, was um, these Abu Sayyaf uh, bandits. They're, uh, they pledged their allegiance to uh, Al-Qaeda and they're Muslim-based, um, Muslim-driven, uh, when, I, when I say that, extremists. Yeah. Um, where they, they do uh, sabotage operations, kidnapping. Uh, mutter laundering, you know, drugs, yeah. whatever it takes for them to find and fuel their uh, their terrorist networks. Kidnapping is definitely one of them. Mm-hmm. So um, there was a missionary group that came in to the Philippines called the Burnhams. And the Burnhams were two Americans, a, a husband and a wife, and they were captured um, and then drugged into the jungles of the southern Philippines where they're uh, being held for ransom. Mm-hmm. The uh, our, our mission quickly got changed uh, from advising, assisting to hostage rescue. Yep. So uh, along with uh, a few elements of the SIL teams that we were working with, we came into the southern regions and we hunted um, uh, down uh, Abu Sayyaf to, to try to rescue these Burnhams. Mm-hmm. Uh, unfortunately, the, uh, the Filipino army stumbled upon them, gun in a gunfight. The husband was killed. Uh, Miss Burnham, she, uh, she made it out alive. And uh, she's currently, you know, living in Kansas now. Mm-hmm. But uh, to tell you the truth, what, what's going on in the Philippines is Abu Sayyaf. They uh, they they put their allegiance to Al Qaeda. They're uh, you know pretty much raising hell yeah. in southern regions of the uh, Philippines to try to kill and wipe out the Christianities. Wow. Uh, what's going on there and the, and the Catholics? Now, was this? A situation where Al Qaeda came in, uh, or had uh, people there that that basically convinced them to swear allegiance, or was this? Uh, would you say this was their decision that they, on their own, decided to swear allegiance to Al Qaeda? I'm curious about the Al Qaeda yeah. presence. Yeah. So I mean, the Philippines is a poor country, man. You know, you mm-hmm. think about like if if I was to put us into America, where people were born into let's say the hood, the ghetto, the, the really low income, yeah. right? Unless something happens, they're going to be in no that future. environment, right? Yeah. Unless unless they become a professional, I don't know, athlete or a scholar or whatever, but it's very hard because the education system's not there. Yeah. So imagine that's what's going on in the Philippines. The education system's not there. It's a poor country. So where are these kids going to go? Yeah. These kids are going to go to escape poverty. Yeah. They're going to join these networks right yeah. because that's be, how they live that's, be, you know, being a member survive. of a gang or a tribe uh, gives you some form of stability yes sir i mean yeah. really. so that's that's what's going on over there uh it's a mix between you know a hybrid between them uh their allegiance to al-qaeda and the extremists and then they're just trying to survive yeah right so what i noticed is when when we were working with the tribes and working with uh these host nations is if you show them a little bit of love show them a little bit of respect you show them a little bit of an out yeah hope then it, it really changes their mindset nobody wants to be a freaking terrorist yeah you know what i mean not 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 in that capacity yeah right so if you give them an out, and that's what I found out as as, as uh, special forces, and now as a Ronin, is you go back in these hardships, you go back in these countries, and you give them an out. You 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 show them the way to be a better person yeah. because unless somebody shows them, it's not going to change any ideology. We could drop as many bombs in a country and kill as many terrorists. You know, as we want, but mm-hmm. it's not going to change anything, man. Yeah. You have to change the root of the problem, you know. And unfortunately, it's very hard to do that because these foreign countries, they want to keep the people down, like Cuba, absolutely, right? Yep. Like, um, like uh, Cuba, like Libya, yeah, the Middle East. You know, when we fought Gaddafi, uh, and and the thing is, the people want to keep them down, like in, in Libya. If they they don't even have internet access, yeah. they can't even go to school unless their schooling is is it's brainwashing how great Gaddafi is. Yeah, 
you know, same like North Korea. Yeah, same thing. They don't have, they don't have a, a it's, it's all propaganda, yeah. you know, and it's, it's to hold the people down and to oppress them. So, and that's what I noticed, man, you know, so in the Philippines, training those guys and fighting next to them, but then they'll turn on you too, mm-hmm. you know, their allegiance turn on you because let's just say this, like, um, and I'm speaking politics and what I've seen. This is my personal take on things. Understand. So don't think that this is what the army feels. Roger that. Yeah. Um, when when I was there training their uh, their LRC, their light reaction force, it was just their top tier counterterrorist unit. We could have easily ended up Busa. We could have easily ended up war. You know, we yeah. we had data on where the Burnhams were a couple of few times. And the thing was, the president. The Filipino president at that time, she did not want the war to end yeah. because she was getting free equipment, free training, free oh. supplies. Their military was growing. Yeah. You understand, you know, so you have to put yourself in their shoes, too. It's a poor country. Mm-hmm. So for America to come in your country to help you out, that's a that's like a free check. Yeah. Right. For that's, their country. That's Santa Claus in green. Yeah. Yeah. So it. it, it it, it goes farther than just a war, my friend, right? Yeah. It goes further than just a commando on the ground. It goes into the politics. Well, it's interesting that you said that uh, also about Libya because the in, in Israel, the Palestine uh, situation, I think is almost a parallel to that. The, the rest of the Arab world needs the Palestinians to be oppressed. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Because, and again, and I'm sure you've heard this too, is that if uh, if the Israelis didn't exist, uh, the Arab countries would all be fighting each other, and, and, and essentially they still are, even though Israel yeah. is there as their as their scapegoat for everything. But by keeping those Palestinians down, uh, it gives them all the reason to hate Israel, so to speak, on, on the world Absolutely. stage. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, let's 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 change it up just a little bit because uh, we're on a little bit of a dark path here. <laughs> Uh, the Philippines. Uh, I know that you are involved in edge weapons and stuff like that, and we're gonna, we're going to try and get to a lot of the stuff today. Uh, <laughs> but it's a broad uh, canvas that you have. Uh, uh, I had the 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 privilege and honor of being able to train with uh, two Filipino guys, uh, Dan and Asanto, and Richard Bastillo. Oh, beautiful! And, yeah, in fact, I moved to California when I was about nineteen. Uh, probably 20 years old, just to go to what was at that time the Filipino Cali Academy. And it was a an eye-opening experience because uh, as a young boy from northern Wisconsin, my, my ability to train in any martial art was either through the pages of Black Belt Magazine or some books, or uh, I had to drive 80 miles each way to go to Duluth, Minnesota to train at the YMCA and a, and a, a Korean Jodo was the only martial art that was available for me. And so uh, I saw my first Bruce Lee movie, et cetera, et cetera, uh, moved out here, and I got to train with, with Dan and, and Richard for, for a while. And so tell me, uh, what Filipino uh, influence have you got in your martial arts, and especially in the edge weapons and stuff like that? Well, having, you know, worked in the Philippines, I mean, when, when I say I was in the Philippines, I was gone in my early stages on my, my team life. I was gone 10 months out of the year. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I was stationed in Okinawa, Japan, where I would study uh, the Japanese martial arts of mm-hmm. uh, Shudo and Japanese Jiu-Jitsu and even into Kendo. Mm-hmm. But the thing was, um, when I went in the Philippines, it was different. Right. The, the the style was different from the Japanese. And when I say that was up until then, my form was very rigid. Yeah. It was very directional, very linear. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, it was a lot of power. But what I found out in the Philippines was it was about intercepting the force. And Bruce Lee talked about in JKD, yep. you know, yep. he, he it permits uh uh, it, they call you know he implements Wing Chun, which mm-hmm. intercepts the force. It's the Chinese version, if I if I would say, of the Philippines, you know, close quarters fighting. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was I was working with the Filipino commandos, and uh, we would come back to uh, base, and uh, so all day sh- training in the shoot house, shooting and, and uh, throwing flashbangs and explosives. Yeah. My friends are tired. My team is like, I'm done. But you know, I had this. <laughs> I had this fire, this passion, right? 
this passion, right? Much I can't describe. It. I had this passion. I know learning, the feeling, right? You understand. You're a martial <laughs> yeah, artist. Yeah. So um, the thing is this. When I came back, I would get with my commando counterparts and I said, teach me Filipino martial arts. And we started off with sticks, which didn't oh, make yeah. any sense, right? And they're like, and the sticks then comes back to the hands, yeah, right? Because they, they believe in sticks and knives extension in your hands. Well, even to today, my mythology is, is, is not like that. It's, it goes from empty hands onto sticks. Because mm-hmm. like you said at the beginning, my friend, you know, we a weapon doesn't make me. No, nope. I am the weapon. Absolutely. My mind is the weapon, right? So the thing was, I when I was studying their mythology, I was taking in their teaching, and I was understanding intercepting the force and angles of attack and off-center line. So it fed well into JKD, mm-hmm. right? It, it fed well oh, yeah. into when I was Indonesia, Salat, and yep. you, you, I'm sure you understand Salat. So mm-hmm. Salat is a lot like Filipino martial arts. Um, so I would study sticks and knives and for a series of four years on and off going in and out of country, Mm -hmm. I would study and I would study the very roots of it. I would go to the very battlegrounds that they fought, Mm -hmm. you know, and I would study and there's a spiritual connection in that. There's a spiritual connection in going to battlegrounds and you can feel the energy. And I study in these, these spiritual battlegrounds Mm -hmm. and that's where I, I find to you know, my knife um, yep. fighting. And then, and then through time going into, you know, in the Middle East, going into Africa, going into um, Indonesia and all these different countries I've been into, that form basically grew and it, it, it basically became my own, yep. you know, because I was able to take in different forms and styles at the very roots of those teachings. Mm-hmm. And I would implement that into my martial arts. Well, how did the, let's just, Ask this question then: uh, How did the martial arts complement your ability to manipulate uh, your firearms and your and that type of training? Did did it have an influence on the way you move and the way you were able to interact with your teammates and stuff? Oh, absolutely! Like my my form of gunfighting is a lot different. You can you can see it. Uh, and, you know, if you watch some of the, my tutorials and videos, you can see the martial art movements in the gunfighting world. Mm-hmm. The thing about this is my body and weight shifts, the way that um, I'm able to pick up my subconscious mind and be able to read stuff around me, and that's martial arts. Mm-hmm. Be able to feel your opponent's energy, uh, same like gunfighting. Be able to read the train, read, go from your conscious mind to your subconscious mind, predict what your enemy's doing based on his uh, patterns of attack mm-hmm. based on his, his, uh, you know, in, in the special forces, we study doctrine, we study tactics and strategy of the enemy. Yep. So what I seen was when I was fighting an enemy, I would see my martial arts come out. I would see how I process information very much, you know, like how we do in martial arts, mm-hmm. you know, my body and my weight shift and everything, my balance, everything moves the same. So gunfighting and martial arts, you have you, it only enhances it. Well, I think people kind of miss the boat when they don't uh, realize that martial arts is martial arts. It's the art of war, uh, gun, knife, stick, uh, nuclear bomb. It's a it's it's a martial art, no matter what. And I'm glad you say that, Ernie, because I, I want to bring this up, man. Because people come to me and they say, "Hey, what forms and style did you use to what What is your style?" Mm-hmm. Well, like like you know, like <laughs> I, I was a student. A Bruce like Bruce. Station. I don't have a form and <laughs> style, right? The thing is this. My form and style extends to the way of a gun, extends to the way of dropping bombs on people, extends to the way of surveillance and counter surveillance. Oh, I was yeah. trained by the special forces. So everything I do, right, implements into my into my teachings. Every every lesson that I learn in the special forces and around the world goes back to the teachings of martial arts. So I, I put it in somehow those teachings into my personal yep. philosophy. Yeah. Well, that's what Bruce was all about. And that's why, you know, if, I don't think people really understand uh, why Bruce wasn't able to teach uh, large classes or open up a whole bunch of schools because he realized early on that every person is an individual and, and it's not a cookie cutter thing. And yeah. you're going to express what you learn uh according to who you are inside and what your mentality is and your physicality and all that. So uh, 
Okay, now you're speaking about some of the uh, training and all that. Uh, the jujitsu that, uh, and I know you mentioned the Japanese jujitsu, uh, and, and I'm gonna, I want to ask you that because uh, <coughs> did you get involved in the Army Combatives program when they were bringing uh, the Gracie jujitsu? Uh, there was a guy that I've known for a long time named Matt Larson who was kind of spearheading some of the army combatives uh did you get exposed to any of that uh too oh yeah absolutely i was at the beginning stages when ufc started coming out uh i was already uh into the special forces uh training Mm -hmm. so uh i I saw how ufc developed when when i say ufc was like the first two episodes remember that when you truly saw the different forms and styles (laughs) right now it's mixed that was so you don't know what the the (laughs) hell they're doing right right you you seen sumo wrestlers you saw judo you know i mean you've seen them all right i I couldn't wait to see about I, I couldn't wait to see judo against Kung Fu and Kung Fu against yeah. Taekwondo. I mean, it was yeah. like, finally. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. The thing about this, you know, was UFC influenced special forces and special operations intended, you know, as an entity because we started bringing in these fighters. Yeah. You know, I, I was trained underneath Horse Gracie, mm-hmm. you know, uh, I was trained underneath Bass Root and a lot of these different guys, you know, that, uh, that you see. He's an ass kicker. Yeah, he's man. a hard punch. <laughs> oh yeah, hitting him is like hitting uh, Oak a Lord. wall. <laughs> you know, yeah. yeah, yeah. He's just a hard man. <laughs> um, but what I realized was um, the martial arts got diluted. When when I say that is we we taken the combat side out of martial art, and made it very sports. Yeah, where jujitsu was truly developed by the Japanese Mm -hmm. during back in the 14 centuries. It was developed for close quarters combat in case they move past the spears and swords. Swords, And now they're going into empty hands or they're going into short range weapons like their Tanto blade. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's very violent. Close quarters combat is one of the most violent things that hasn't changed today. Okay, because you truly find out who you are in a close quarters fight because you don't have time anymore. You don't have time to process anything anymore because they've taken the time because they took the distance away. Yep. From, right. Yeah. And distance is in time. My, that's right. And in my former job, it was all about me closing in with my enemy. You know, I had to enter the house. I had to close in with the threat. Yep. I had to deploy from the United States to fly into the combat zone to close in with that enemy. Yep. And when, when, when I move into close quarters, well, you don't have time. Yeah. Right? So what I noticed was the sports side of my training really interfered with my lethality because it changed my mindset. Like, you, let, let's, just, let's just talk about jiu-jitsu, Brazilian jiu-jitsu, yeah. right? Well, you talked about submission before uh, position, uh, position before submission. Right. We always talk yep. about that. And it's and it's not fair. It's, it's, it's not a, a good thing to tap them out by knee bars or uh, ankle locks or whatever. Well, my friend, there's no rules. Yeah. War, right. Yep. So in the martial arts, they give you fine guidelines of what is fair and what is not fair because everything is sports. Now, think about yeah. karate when, they, it, you know, when they're hitting, it's a point system. A point system yeah. e- even in the modern day USC, which is the closest to a real fight, mm-hmm. it's still in a cage. Yeah. It's still in it's a still controlled a ref. environment with a referee stopping the fight once you hit a certain area. Yeah. Well, one of my favorite moves in actual fight is I do eye gouges. I, oh, yeah will put my fingers through somebody's eyes, right? So how can you mimic that? Yeah. How can you mimic that? Or how can you mimic if you hit me hard enough and I know I can't win against a hand-to-hand fight, then I'm going to employ a blade or a gun on you. Yeah. Because the teachings of Budo, the teachings of war is if you hit me, I will break your bones. If you break my bones, then I'll take your life. I'll kill you. Right? And that's truly the meaning of war. That's the mindset of war. But in the martial arts where I was trained, it was too many rules. It wasn't until I got to war and combat is when I understood this and I, I, I stepped away from the sports and I took back the lethality that was yeah. taken away from the combat side. Well, it's interesting, too, that you bring that up because uh, I've seen some drunken, untrained guys with bad intent 
beat the living hell out of black belts from yeah. time to time. Yeah. And uh, yes. just because that bad intent and the fact that they weren't bound, there was no rules. It, it, yeah. Nothing was holding them back. Uh, and in combat, that's what it comes down to. You, you're the one who has to go home at night. And yes, sir. One thing, uh, there's a guy named Rory Miller that uh, he's got some good books out, and I've, I've read a couple of them. But he, he made a comment in there about uh, the difference between uh, capacity and capability. You can train to have all these capabilities, but if you don't have the capacity to, put your, to gouge someone's eye out, uh, what good is the training? And he said, quite simply, it comes down to this. It, it, when it comes down to moral justification for, for going past the uh, what most people, I, I mean, honest, most martial artists will never, ever think about an eye gouge because it's just not in our world, in our safe zones. And he said, look, here's the deal. Have that guy make my kids orphans or me make his kids orphans. That's a no-brainer. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and that's really what it comes down to when, when you're in a life or death combat situation is it's you have to survive and you have to defeat, uh, the, yeah. the enemy. You know, I, I tell you, Ernie, when it, what, what I had to change my mindset, you know, when I got out of the military, there was a lot of negative energy, you know, because I've seen a lot, I've seen mm-hmm. a lot during my time. And, um, how, how long have you been? I had to, to three years okay. and I served, I served about 22.9 years. Okay. All right. And majority of it was special ops. Yeah. And um, 14 years as war. Yeah. So I, I had my share. And what I noticed was when I got out, I had to change my mindset. And there's a book called The, uh, the Life-Giving Sword, right, where it talks about a samurai and how he uh, rationalized taking life. And the thing is this. If you have one tyrant that tortures millions of people, right, mm-hmm. and uh, disables millions of people and tortures and, and oppress them, if I could take out that one tyrant, then I save millions of lives, yeah. right? So when when I approach the martial arts, I have no rules and no binds because I I, I never took out the lethality out of yeah. my style, right? Yeah. So. I have no rules, but that comes with a mindset. That comes with a mindset because we are trained in today's modern world to what? Thou shall not kill. Yeah. Be friendly to your neighbors, right? So back then, back, I, I'll even go back to the caveman days, yeah. right? Back in the caveman days, it was all about territory, food, Water. terrain, yep. survivability, right? And they're going to take away that to survive. Well, if you're going to torture all these people and the United States feel like, hey, I'm going to employ to you and his unit yep. over there. Well, my job is to take out that tyrant so others can live. Yeah. So when I approach that, I have no rules. Yeah. See, so when people say, hey, show me some of your moves. Well, I can to a certain point, but I train my mindset already to go there. Yeah. So without, you know, the state of Mushin, mm-hmm. right? The state of no mind. Right? Yeah. The, so for, for loss the of self. Yeah. The yeah. state of Mushin is a state of normal mind where all thoughts and emotions are limited and truly your training kicks in. Well, my training is to take out a high. My training yeah. is to fuck up somebody's equilibrium by hitting their ear enough where it bleeds. Yeah. You know, I, I don't have rules. So it's hard for me to hold things back when we're in a dojo sparring because my mindset's different. Yeah. You see? Well, you're going to fight like you train. So, yeah. you know, having yeah. come from that environment, I, I've got it. Uh, yeah. You know, Hoist, uh, you mentioned Hoist Gracie. Hoist, we have a school here at, at our factory. In fact, it's it's the Hoist Gracie Jiu-Jitsu South Bay. It's his home school. And Hoist is, uh, it, it, we're lucky enough that they we've been, well, I, I was lucky enough that uh, I got a chance to go out and train with Dan and Asanto and Richard for about yes. 10 years because they were, I was here and it was close. And then one day, uh, one of my buddies at the school came over and said, man, you got to, you got to check out these Brazilian guys. This is crazy, crazy stuff. And, uh, I said, okay, what, what's going on? He goes, man, they've, they've had these competitions, right? And so come on over to the house. And so he popped in the VHS tape and it was the, uh, Gracie and action tapes. Right. And I was like, God, 
God damn, man, I, this, yeah. I, I, I got to do this. And uh, then I find out they're like three blocks from where I lived. So oh, wow. I, I just happened to be in the, the right place at the right time. Yeah. And uh, pretty soon, uh, honest, within probably about four or five months, my wife was training there. My middle daughter was training there. My oldest daughter was training there. I was training there because we, we dove in full force. And yeah. It's funny because uh, I've still never given up on uh, JKD or the Filipino stuff because it's such an integral part of who I am, so to speak, uh, and, and I love it. I, I just love hitting the bag and training, you know, the flow and, and the, just the body mechanics of it. But uh, the jiu-jitsu is one of those things that if really, uh, if if I do have to get into a scrap with someone, and I've been lucky enough not to have that happen for a number of years now, I, I, maybe I got a little wiser on how to not be an asshole. But uh, it would have to, I'd have to take the guys to the ground because as an older yeah. guy, I don't think I can swing as hard and fast yeah. as I used to when I was 25. Yeah. And that's the cool thing, too, about the, the jujitsu. Now, I wanted to ask you. Uh, did you ever have to resort to any hand-to-hand situations in, in your job? You don't have to go into all the the details oh, of it, but uh, of course, yeah, of course, I, I had to. I've, I've been in countries that uh, I'm one of the few Americans, and me being a 205 pound Asian tattooed out coming out of the U.S. Embassy, you're going to get targeted, right? Yeah. So people want to know why the hell you in their country. They're going to put surveillance teams on you. Yep. Uh, that's when your trade craft and street craft kicks yeah. in your training. But the thing was, people want to hurt you, and they want to uh, they want to interrogate you, hurt you, capture you, whatever. And you have to understand your operational environment, and you have to understand yourself, mm-hmm. right, and your, your capabilities. And yes, people have tried to hurt me. Uh, I have employed hand to hand to save my life, and you and know, you're still here still here yeah yeah you know the with uh, it was funny because i was talking to a guy the other day with gina haskell being the uh the new head of the cia and they were they were questioning her about uh all of the uh enhanced ter- interrogation techniques and all that i heard something that uh and, and i just want you to if you feel comfortable about talking about it for a sec that's cool if not that's cool too uh they asked her about uh, waterboarding and, and stuff like that. And the guy that I was talking to said, look, if, if all they did to our guys was waterboard them, that'd be a good day. And yeah. uh, I don't think people understand some of that, uh, what the environment is on the other side. When you go into a potential dangerous situation, they're fighting with no rules. We fight with all the rules. And... Uh, I wanted to ask you about the about waterboarding, just because I know you're a special forces guy and all that. Uh, have you got, gone through that in your training? Yeah, so we go through different um, SEER school, survival, mm-hmm. evasion, resistance, escape training. I've been through four different levels of SEER, just mm-hmm. because I had to work outside of war zones and um, and some of the other sensitive jobs. But the thing is this, water torture... It's definitely one of the uh, techniques that we have used, but you will be water tortured uh, during your SEER training. You under, yep. you know how it feels. You know, I have drowned before, like mm-hmm. passed out, yeah. um, just because we take our training so far on the edge. Guys have yeah. died on our training. And for me, you got to know yourself, right, Ernie? Yeah. Right? So for me, I, I do have a human side. Mm-hmm. You know, even though I I fight against evil and stuff, I do have a human side. Of, I can't torture people. Yeah. If I'm going to take life, I'll take life, right? If 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 I have to question them, then usually we hand them over to a more proficient interrogator. Mm-hmm. Uh, obviously, I have to install fear uh, initial, yeah. you know, during the initial phase. But as a human... Um, you know, there's there's certain techniques that um, that I personally cannot do. Yeah. But I'm not saying it's right or wrong for the agencies and other organizations to use it. And my you know teams use that all the time. Mm-hmm. I'm saying for me as a human being, there's certain techniques that uh, I don't employ. Yeah. Well, it's it, it's important though to know that 
they're they're using those things against us. And, oh yeah, uh, they yeah. have no rules. They have no rules, and and it bothers me sometimes when uh, we hear about uh, how much. And I'm not even talking about torture now. I'm just talking about the rules of engagement that you guys had to uh, operate under. Uh, it, it started, I think, with uh, you, they had to have a. a a firearm in their hand and then it changed to they had to be pointing it at you and then i think it changed actually they had to they had to fire first kind of thing it, it, did you uh, well special ops is a little bit different we have more gloves off mm-hmm. but the thing is this you know when when we go into outside of war zones into the conflict areas mm-hmm. i mean uh, you can see it on youtube guys green berets are getting killed over in africa yeah training I saw that. you know training guys you know in ambushes and the thing is this is that you have to understand your operational environment. You have to understand your training and how how that is employed to the operational environment. You have to be really smart, you know? It's not about kicking in the door. It's not mm-hmm. about how strong or fast I can shoot. It's truly about how smart and intellectual you oh, are. Yeah. How can you read that terrain, understand the infrastructure, understand the people and their hardships, understand the environment and the operation of our and truly understand your capabilities and the limitations you have. So when I said this is war is war. I have the assets to drop bombs. I have the rules of engagement to kill if necessary, depending on my mission. Okay. Mm-hmm. But when I go into these conflict areas and I'm training, well, the government says, Hey, that's a training area. You're just there for training and advising assisting. Okay. So they're not going to give you these war assets, these war machines. They're not mm-hmm. going to have a prep feed. They're not going to have uh, a reinforcement uh, coming for you. You're maybe six guys on the ground yeah. with a bunch of rebels that can turn on you at any time. So you tell me which was more dangerous. <laughs> right? So yeah. It. So when people when people talk to me and they're like, well, war is, yeah, war was dangerous. But the conflict there is it's extremely dangerous, and you have to be really smart, you know, in the way you navigate through those countries. You know, it's funny because uh, I think a lot of times people have a misconception about special forces uh, and spec war guys and all that. They think that, uh, you know, they look at the guys and they see these are really highly conditioned, strong, uh, you know, manly men, if you will. Uh, but they, they don't – they think it's all about being a linebacker. And uh, I think they kind of missed the point. You know, special operations soldiers are highly intelligent, highly trained, highly educated in a, a wide, they have a beyond a doctorate's degree in a wide variety of, of disciplines. Uh, and it really is your brain that, that's yes. your most important asset. It isn't how strong you are or, or how good you can shoot, like you just said. Uh, those things matter. That's for damn sure. Yes. Yeah. But uh, in the end, it's it's the it's the power of the mind. I mean, hey, listen, uh, I see you've got uh, a shirt on that says Ronan. Uh, explain to the people here who might not know uh, what that term means and where did it come from and how does that apply to you? Why why do you have that shirt on? Well, well, Ronan has a deep meaning. It's there's deep history in the samurai culture and the Japanese culture. I, I live in Japan for six years and I, I immersed myself in the teachings of Bushido and Budo. Um, just as a martial artist, that was a natural path for me. Mm-hmm. So as a Ronin, a Ronin by definition is a master of samurai, right? So a samurai born in noble blood, just like a medieval knight, a European knight. It's just a, a in, in Japan, they had their, their knights of his time. Mm-hmm. And samurai is pretty much a masterless, right? So, Samurai mean to serve, right? Yep. To serve a higher lord. Well, when it, when the samurai stops serving that lord through his death or whatever, he becomes Ronin. He becomes masterless. So he roams the earth. Yep. So a lot of people think that's very shameful, like, you know, how they betrayed it in the past. I mean, Ronin means waving, right? Mm-hmm. It, it also means unemployed right so <laughs> out of work it means yeah out of work right <laughs> samurai for hire maybe <laughs> yeah yeah so i i always believed in that higher purpose i always believed in the bushido code when i when i was in my process of getting out of the military after i stepped off my final battleground in africa i spent 
five years in Africa towards the end of my career. And uh, I was part of the teams that went into Libya after mm-hmm. the fall of Libya. Yeah. And um, I, I just realized that this is not my path anymore. Yeah. You know, war has taken hold of me and it's made me into a person that I didn't want to be. And when, when I say that is, it made me into fire. It made me into hate. Mm-hmm. And I hated, I hated uh, the world. Uh, I hated people. Mm-hmm. Uh, and not everybody. I'm just saying the okay. evils. I right? got you, man. I, I got tired of it. And, and, and at, at a certain point, I hated myself. Mm-hmm. Right? So I hated the way that uh, my mindset and what I became and who I became. Mm-hmm. Right? The war takes a lot out of you, Ernie. Oh, God. It does, man. Yeah. Right? Even to the strong. So I, I needed a change. And um, I was lost at one time in my life, and through through that dark uh, stages of my life, I put uh, I finally picked up that book of Five Rings again, and I read it, and it had a new, different meaning. Another new time. book, yeah. And one of the things that that made me into who I am was that Miyamoto Masashi he said, "Do not look for strength external. Everything comes from within. All your love, all your passion, everything comes from within you." And I knew this was a martial artist. I knew. Mm-hmm. But I needed to hear those words at that moment. I needed to read that. I needed to hear it. Right? And then from there, because I was looking for strength everywhere, man. I was yeah. looking through my father. I was looking through my teammates. Man, I was looking for all the wrong places. I was looking at my soul. Yep. Right? So after I read the book of Five Rings... Um, so people that don't know Miyamoto Masashi, he was born in the late 1500s. He was a master swordsman. He wrote the Book of Five Rings as he meditated and died of stomach cancer in a Buddhist cave in 1645, mm-hmm. where he broke down the elements of wind, fire, water, void, earth. So all these teachings is, is more short teachings. But what people don't understand was Miyamoto was a ronin. See, he was born Ronin. Mm-hmm. He was born masterless, right? Because his father was samurai. Yeah. And his father was a Ronin when Miyamoto was brought into this world. So his his oh. his father taught him the ways, see? Mm-hmm. And Miyamoto became almost like a drifter, a, a, a masterless warrior yeah. that taught himself the art of Ishiru, which is the art of dual swords. Mm-hmm. And he employed strategy and tactics throughout his whole life. They fought like 70 plus duels and won every single one, right? Mm -hmm. And then, but through his later years, he reflected back on life and it was about self-development. And I I reached a certain point where I fought wars and I I, I studied the art of violence through my whole life. Mm -hmm. My my true existence and how I was born was through violence, right? Yep. And I, I didn't want that. I didn't want that life for me anymore. Mm -hmm. So when I stepped off the battlefield, I needed to find myself. And that's where Ronin, I came out as a Ronin. Through the darkness, I surfaced as a Ronin. I surfaced as a masterless warrior. Now, we we can, you know, a lot of guys like hold me dear to the the name Ronin. They're like, oh, Ronin means samurai. You're not a samurai. Well, yeah, samurais died (laughs) hundreds of years ago. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, but I'm, I have served my Lord, yep. and I believe in the ideologies of the martial arts. So I am a modern-day Ronin. I am truly masterless. Yep. And with, with this newfound freedom, I decided to understand myself spiritually, right? To really look at myself spiritually. And, and Bruce Lee even said, you know, don't ask for a easy life. Ask for the strength to endure a difficult life. Yep. So I knew, like, I, I watched the news and I was seeing the turn, like, you know, with the law enforcement and how they're fighting now against terrorism. Yeah. All right. They're fighting against terrorists and military, paramilitary tactics. That I see it. Yeah. Right. So I, I started uh, my own company called Ronin uh, Tactics. And pretty much I, I travel around the United States to teach mm-hmm. right not just not just military or uh, law enforcement but I teach the bands to better educate themselves for the battle that's going to come yeah okay and even the battles within right I, I help guys that that uh, were 
ready to take their life, actually. Yeah. And, you know, a few words and encouragement, they helped him. And I realized that this is my path. This is the path that is going to heal me. And this yeah. is the path that's going to make me a better person who I want to be. So I, pers- I, I pursued it with full passion. And along with that came, uh, I broke out my war journals uh, mm-hmm. that I wrote uh, through the phases of my career. And I started surfacing ideas and emotions that I, I kept bottled up for so long. Mm-hmm. And I tried to rationalize and understand it, right? So I, along with that came, you know, product development and everything else mm-hmm. to try to enhance the battlefield, you know. Um, but that's what I'm doing now as a Ronin, and that's how it be- uh, affected me through the teachings of the five rings and the <laughs> teachings of Miyamoto Masashi, who was Ronin, um, yeah. you know, our paths were kind of, in a way, kind of similar. When I say that was Miyamoto was born, he, he actually killed his mother. Uh, his mother died uh, giving birth to him. Mm-hmm. So the father, the father held great grudges against Oh, and Miyamoto was kind of arrogant as a little boy as mm-hmm. well. So he got his, his ass handed him on a daily basis, oh, yeah. you know. But it hardened him yeah. because his life was 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 hard, right? It was an easy path. I, For me, when I came to America, I was an accepted Ernie as an American. Even when I became a, a, a citizen of the United States and, sw- and raised my right hand to be mm-hmm. an American, I wasn't accepted. I looked different. Yeah. Right. And uh, I got beat down on a daily basis. I, I felt the full yeah. weight of racism. And when, when I say that, when people, when people hear the word racism, uh, and let me explain why I, I felt the full weight of racism. Mm-hmm. Remember, I escaped Vietnam. Yeah. And I came and I was raised in the biggest military base in America. So you think about the, the, the military and all the kids. Right. So in everybody's mind, the Vietnamese were our enemy. They're yeah, communists. Absolutely. But they didn't understand that there was a North and South Vietnamese. Yeah. Not a lot of them. So I got picked on on a daily basis. I got called racist names. I yeah. got called the, the name of the enemy that took my life. They took my freedom away from me. They're, they're, yeah. they're putting me in that same group. And I fought against it, against racism every day. Mm hmm. Even to the point I was in the army, I fought against racism. You know, yeah. because I, I, I was it's, different. I looked different. Well, you know, you you touched on something there about you found your new path, and I was going to say, you know, the the greatest gift that you can give to yourself is to give to others. Yes, and yes. it sounds like that's where you're now at, and and the yeah. you know, I've talked to other people about this. Uh, recently is that you know there's very few people you know you in the world that we're in with with training and all of that we we surround ourselves with like-minded people and people that are kind of doing the same thing so it seems like everyone is doing this but it's they're not there are very 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 few people in the world that get the the privilege to give life saving skills to others and to be in that club is that to me is like the epitome of of, of where uh, where whatever path it was that you were on or I was on or any of your uh, teammates or anybody was on. If you reach that point, uh, that's the goal, and yeah. uh, you know it. Then everything becomes worth it uh, because it brought you there to where you are able so, to save other people now. The uh, Sakura, you know, Japanese cherry blossom, symbol for life, mm-hmm. right? So for our listeners is, so Sakura, the Japanese, especially samurai, they view this Japanese cherry blossom as life itself because it was a seasonal flower. It would bloom in the spring. Any light wind can knock that, that, that beautiful blossom off, right and, and it does, right? Where I'm going with this was there was a time in my – there was a time – in my career where I would sit down with my friends and we would talk and we would conversate and we'd talk about life. And I remember um, I was coming off a three month combat rotation. I was tired, mm-hmm. you know, and there was a friend that came in and we were friends in special forces and we grew up together. 
and he came in, we, we call it rip, you know, relieving place where mm-hmm. he takes over my rotation, right? And I'm leaving yep. country. So I had roughly about 24 hours before I left country. He was going out that night on a mission. And, um, you know, he asked to, to do, you know, eat dinner together. And, mm-hmm. you know, we, we had a mess hall. And I had the pack. There was a lot of things going on in my mind. And I was trying to make excuses. Say, hey, I just really can't. I, I got to do this. I got to take inventory. But finally, something in me said, you know what? Fuck it. All right, I'll go have coffee. Yep. And you know, it was Saturn. It was during this whole conversation as my friend was talking to me. All I could think about was going home. Yeah. And, um, in this combat because that rotation took a lot on me. Mm-hmm. I didn't realize that it was going to be our last conversation because he died. Wow. You see? And I have been there in the final moments of some of my friends mm-hmm. die where, where I saw the life leave from their body. When you, when you truly see life leave from a, one, your loved one's body, it's truly a sad thing, but it's yeah. a beautiful thing because you see the true essence of what Sakura meant to the Japanese. So I truly know what that means. And I swore an oath to myself that I would live a life that my teammates will be proud of. I would live a life of higher purpose, even though when I get out, Mm -hmm. because when I'm that old man, I'm dying sick in my bed. I will look back and I said, I have, I have lived a life for me and for my teammates and for everybody else, I have lived a life of a thousand lives. Yeah. You see? Yeah. The more people you help, man, the more people oh. you affect. See? And that is the martial arts. You know, um, I've never heard it put quite quite like that. And it's 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 tough to listen to it, I gotta be honest with you, because it's 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 hitting me in the heart, let's say that. Yeah. And and I I'm deeply impressed with what that journey's been for you and all that. Yeah. And to get to that point, it, it's it takes honest soul searching. Yeah. I, I, you have to be brutally honest with yourself to to reach yeah. a point like that. And I, I again, uh, I applaud you for. It's very no, moving. Thank you. Very very moving. And uh, I'm going to switch completely around again. And. <laughs> Tell me about that TV show. What, what's what's oh, the wow. name of it? Where it is? I know you're you're yeah. integrally involved with it. Uh, tell us about it. Uh, let me know what's up with that. Well, you know the path of Ronan. For me, the path of Ronan is to influence people's lives, to affect people, and also to have deep understanding of myself. Mm-hmm. And along with that comes experience. Right and to meet new people and to experience new experiences in life. It's not about war and fighting all the time. It's about experiencing life, man. Yeah. Right. So there was an opportunity that came out. Uh, there was a, a talent agency that called me for the History Channel. Mm-hmm. I have no idea how they found me. I'm pretty sure social media. <laughs> um, but they they said, "Hey, look, you know, we have a TV show coming out uh, called Force and Fire: Knife or Death." We want to bring you on as a co-host to Bill Goldberg. Mm-hmm. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's such a great guy. And, Larger um, than life guy. <laughs> and I was, yeah, he is. He's yeah. such full of energy. I love him. I love that guy. But um, the thing was, they say, hey, I said, well, what's the show going to be about? And they're like, uh, you're going to basically look at people how to run through an obstacle course like uh, Ninja Warrior with a knife. I'm like, perfect. That's absolutely <laughs> perfect. And then uh, they were like, yeah, we want you to co-host. I'm like, cool. Absolutely. So they had me on a few interviews where they had me bring a YouTube video and here I am like, that's not how you do it. This is the you should do your and, uh, They liked it. So uh, they flew me out to Atlanta where I met Bill Goldberg where he became yep. uh, friends immediately. And um and then we, we started that show, Forge and Fire, Night for Death. Now, the show did very well the first pilot season. Mm-hmm. So they they, uh, they filmed six episodes, which took me roughly about 10 days to film, mm-hmm. uh, the initial one. And um, it did very well. It, it was actually rated the number two show on the History Channel. Oh, no uh, kidding. And it was rated, yeah, it was rated number 12 through all the networks. Wow. Right. So uh, we're, we're going to start filming in, in three weeks, mm-hmm. uh, season two. And, oh, that's uh, excellent! Excited, 
yeah, excited to see my friend. But that show has definitely allowed me to meet interesting people, allow oh, yeah. me to to grow as a human, mm-hmm. as a human being, because I'm experiencing a new world. And I tell you, Ernie, this this new world, there's some things I like and some things I'm just not used to. Yet, <laughs> right? Um, like uh, I had my own movie trailer, you know. I had my <laughs> own like, you know. Um, they, yeah. they would treat all their, you know, their talents, they call us, yeah. you know, like a movie star. You know, I had my own assistant, you know, and, <laughs> and I'm not used to that. In fact, I was bringing my assistant coffee, right? And she's <laughs> like, no, no, you know, because that's that's the martial art way. You yeah, know, you yeah. always think about others before yourself. Well, well, I remember I was hungry and I would fix food and I would bring it to my assistant. She was like, no, no, I'm supposed to bring you food. No. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's a learning experience. It's a journey. Yeah. And like I said, my journey of a thousand miles, right? So mm. this is part of my journey now. Well, it, it must be quite a contrast because uh, you are from a world of the quiet professionals. And now all of a sudden, yeah. there's a spotlight. And <laughs> uh, that's another paradigm shift you, you probably had to warm up to a little bit. <laughs> I do. I do. You know, and but I, I'm getting better at it because I remember when I first started, my life was so secret. I lived that, that oh, team yeah. life for so long and everything's so secret. And even your friends, you have to be very selective who your friends are. But yeah. now I could truly live, Ernie. Yeah. I could truly live now. And I can truly meet people without any hold backs. You know, of course yeah. I don't talk about my classified stuff, but who cares about yeah. that? That's not who I am anymore. Yep. You know? But I could truly grow now. Yeah. You know, and it's very spiritual. It's a connection. In that. Well, I, I'm i telling you, I, I feel like I'm in church when I'm talking to you. Honest, I'm not <laughs> I'm not stroking you, man. I'm telling you, it, it's it's inspirational, just the conversation that we've had now. And uh, to know to know that your life could have ended thousands of times. Your, your life could have ended in that street in, in Saigon. Uh, yeah. just as easy as, as anyone else that, that has died. And then to go through uh, all of the uh, experiences that you've had since that time and uh, to be able to get to this point and then grow to where you are, uh, is a, it's, a, it's truly a, an inspirational story. And I, I hope that other guys that have come from the combat environment uh, you know, you, you get cut loose and you have no more mission. And it seems like what you've described to me and yourself is that you were always in search of a mission, no matter what it was. And you found it uh, and created it for yourself. And I think that that's part of what happens with our, with our vets at times is that they end up without a mission. Yeah. And, you know, it, it's, it's doable. I mean, it's tough. People that have not been in combat, and, and I have not, so I can't say anything about it, uh, except that I know that it does change you. Uh, but it can be healed, and it can yeah. be, you can be brought back to the circle. And yeah. uh, I think a lot of guys have a time when uh, they just get so dark that... Uh, they don't see a way out. Like you said, those kids, they're, they're, there's, no, there's no gang for them anymore. And uh, come from a team environment, especially, uh, you know, those guys are more important to you than your own life. Yeah. And uh, anyway, I'm getting all dark again. I, I, I didn't want to do that. I, 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 I applaud you on your success. Uh, well, thank you. It's an incredible journey. Yeah. It is. And I'm... And you know what? What's funny is I, I wrote a thing. I haven't posted it. But I wrote it to myself, mm-hmm. and it, it was called "Hello, my name's Two. I'm happy to meet you." That was the title, right? <laughs> and sometimes when I when I when I think and I meditate, I have I have communications with others, right? Mm-hmm. As in when I say I write down my 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 mindset, my train of thought at that time, and later on I will share what I'm writing. But one of the things was, hello, my name is Two Lamb, nice to meet you, was that that statement is truly a deeper statement than just that. Mm -hmm. Because my path was very secretive, where 
if I continue on that path, I would have never said that comment to Ernie. I would never say hi, Ernie. Yeah. It's nice to meet you, man. Because I would never stepped away from that dark, secret world. Yeah. And when I became a Ronin, I was able to release all that. Right? Yeah, there's stuff I'm not going to talk about, obviously, because oh, yeah. of my, uh, my promise to the, the government. Mm-hmm. But the thing is this, is that, man, is it great to meet people. Man, is it great to share your views and, and, and affect people more than just a movement, right? Because martial art, when I teach everybody, like they want to learn how to shoot fight. It's deeper than that. It's deeper than that because it's the mind that moves the body. And if I could train the mind and train a new way of thinking, because I had, I had to train myself in a new way of thinking. Because mm-hmm. Ernie, I was going down a dark path. Oh, yeah. You know? Yeah. But if I could help others navigate through that dark path, well, that's a Ronin. Yeah. That's truly, that's truly what, why I started Ronin. Well, congratulations. Cause uh, it's Thank obvious you. that it has, has changed you and it's, it's something now that is benefiting others. And, uh, I've just, I, at some point, if you're ever down in the LA area, uh, I, I would you love gotta to come by yeah. or if I'm, I, you're yeah. kind of off the grid up there in, in, in uh, in uh, Colorado, and uh, yeah. maybe I'll get a chance to come up there sometime. But I'd love to uh, sit down and uh, and and really just uh, more than anything, just continue this conversation. So, uh, yeah, I'd love to. Yeah, we we've, we've gone almost an hour and a half too, and uh, wow, that's fast. <laughs> yeah, I, I, there's so many other things I'd like to talk about, uh, but let's let's leave it at this. Uh, let's do this again sometime. Uh, Absolutely, I, I would love to. I I I want to get into some of the. Uh, uh, you know, it's obvious you're a physically fit guy. Uh, I want to get into some of the the training that you've done over the years and all that, uh, to uh, you know, nutrition, all of those good things, because yeah. uh, that's what our that's what our people are all about, and and that's what I'm trying to do with this podcast is uh, leave everybody a little better off, uh, having listened to any of the episodes than they were before they started, and uh, it's obvious that's where you're at. So. Uh, Let's do this. Let's 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 do this again sometime. Uh, yes, absolutely. Yeah, and uh, I want to ask you: How can people get a hold of you? How can they contact you, or whatever it is that that you would like? How could they arrange to be uh, in any of your classes or anything? Can you can you give us all that information? Absolutely. So you can find me on social media on Facebook. Um, under Ronin Tactics, you'll see a red dragon, which is the Ronin War Dragon. Uh, you can see me on Instagram under Ronin Tactics, the War Dragon. Um, you can go to our website at www.ronintactics.com. In fact, if anybody who wants to train, uh, and let's just say they're overseas, we get asked to go overseas a lot, but mm-hmm. obviously my schedule, I, I, I don't have time to travel everywhere. So we just started filming our training modules. So oh, we wow. just released our first online training module last night and it's doing very well. Uh, just having cool. released last night, but you can log on to ronintactics.com under training and events and go to online training. And then uh, you can see the training. The training goes deeper than just hand in hand. It goes into blades, gunfighting. It actually goes into philosophy and mindset, what you need in order to navigate, just become a, a better human being, not just a fighter. I understand. Just be a better human being. Yeah. Right. So, really excited about that. Uh, more training modules to come as you know, as I as I travel and film. Um, we we are going to Japan, mm-hmm. and. Um, in October this year, it'll be very spiritual. I'm going to go to the 47 Ronin gravesite. Oh, yeah. uh, we'll pay my respects to Miyamoto Masashi. And then uh, they just, uh, the Japanese hand forged a sword for me mm-hmm. in Japan uh, where they had to approve it through their, their country. Oh, yeah. But they'll be presenting me the sword when I uh, when I come visit in Japan. So oh, that's, that's cool. Uh, a huge ceremony, you know, traditional kimono. I'll be in my black uh, suit, mm-hmm. uh, but I, I, I'm, I'm filming everything, and uh, I'll be sharing my journey of a thousand miles. There you go with, uh, with my followers and on the social media. Excellent. And when we get a, get together again, I'll tell you my Japanese story because I was over there uh, and had 
had a really good experience. And uh, I've been to some of those grave sites, and I've been with, with some of the uh, swordsmiths and some of the other uh, craftsmen in there. So uh, we'll talk about all that. Maybe maybe they were yeah. some of the same people. Who knows? Uh, yeah. Well, too, this, is, this has been uh, outstanding, and uh, I'm just uh, – I can't wait to do it again. Uh, I can't meet her, know. man. And I can't wait to meet this you in cool. person. I, like I said, I've always been a big fan of your, uh, your blades and <laughs> and everything else. And now I'm a big fan of you oh, and, for and, gosh, and your mindset. So I, I can't wait to meet us when you meet you in person, man. Well, we'll make that happen. And uh, we'll stay in touch. Yeah. Cause, uh, uh, and again, uh, everybody, you got to watch that. What's the name of that TV show again? It's Forged in Fire, Knife or Death, History oh. Channel. Excellent. Uh, all right. Well, uh, too, that's going to wrap it up for today. Thank you very much. Uh, Hi. I just uh, thank you for taking the time. I know you're busy, and uh, it's been it's been a lot of fun. I really enjoyed it, man. Yes, it has. I enjoy our conversation. Ernie. Cool, thank man. you so much. We will see you down the road. Bye, too. Hi. Bye, too. Bye, 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 guys. Bye, bye. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, that was a. That was an outstanding conversation that I had with a with an outstanding human being, and I, I'll tell you, Danny, I, I know that he is a hard, hard man, and he is a dangerous man. But I'll tell you, I, there were times when uh, it almost brought tears to my eyes uh, just to feel that passion and, and to hear that story. Uh, you know, to come out on on this end of it uh, from what he's been through. I mean, yeah. what excuse do we have? for not being fulfilled in, in, in whole human beings. I mean, what are our, our our hardships in comparison to some of the things that 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 he's had to endure? I mean, I, I have no really excuses. Compare. I, I don't... I, I have no excuses. No comparison. <laughs> yeah. So, ladies and gentlemen, I, I hope you enjoyed this. Uh, you know, we will do this again. Uh, I, think, uh, I think there's a lot more... Uh, to discuss with uh, two lamb and uh, we wish him all the success in all of his endeavors and uh, Danny I think that'll pretty much wrap it up for today cool awesome yeah thank you Danny I wanted to thank our sponsors today uh, Hoist Gracie uh, Jiu Jitsu South Bay uh, and uh, they're formed at uh, Hoist Gracie South Bay uh, Hoist Gracie Jiu Jitsu South Bay dot com yeah, and uh, also uh, uh, the Order of the Black Shamrock found at uh, Order of the Black Shamrock dot com, and uh, you can uh, subscribe to the podcast. Uh, you can uh, find us on all the podcast apps, Twitters and Instagrams and Stitchers and all that good stuff. So we're we're out there, and uh, you know I just wanted to uh, be sure that uh, we all take time to to thank all the people that make our wonderful lives possible. And uh, so I want to just say, hey, you know what? It's time to uh, think every once in a while uh, in your busy day. Uh, take the time to uh, to think about. And, and, and if you meet any of these people in person, to, to put your hand out and, and thank them and tell them how much you appreciate uh, what they're doing. And those people are the, uh, the soldiers, uh, the sailors, the airmen, the Marines, the Coasties, uh, all of the people that uh, wear the uniform or the badge, uh, including all of our first responders. Uh, You know, those people are out there every day doing uh, the the dirty work that uh, keep us safe and putting their lives and and their futures on the line. And uh, we owe them everything. Uh, You know, our ability to have uh, uh, the greatest nation that uh, has ever existed on this planet is a result of the efforts of those people, the, the sacrifices that they've made and are, and are still going to be making for us. And it's because of their efforts that uh, all of us can uh, sleep soundly uh, in our beds at night. And uh, we thank all of you and are eternally grateful for your service and uh, all the things that you do for us. And uh, on that note, Danny, I think it's time to say goodbye. Very good. Signing out.